Oh my Lord, son of Basim. So all pervading personality of God is from our respective base. Meditate upon Lord Sri Krishna because he is the absolute truth. And the primeval cause of all causes of the creation, sustenance, and destruction of the manifested universe. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations. And he is independent because there's no other cause beyond him. <clears throat> It is he only who first in, uh, in, uh, his he only who first instructed the Vedic knowledge into the heart of Brahmaj. The original living being. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. As one is bewildered by the illusory representation of water seen on fire or land seen on water. Only because of him do the material universes, temporarily manifested by the reactions of the three modes of nature, appear factual, although they are unreal. I therefore meditate upon him, Lord Sri Krishna, who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode, which is forever free from the illusory representations of the material world. I meditate upon him, for he is the absolute truth. Dharma Pujita Kaitravotra Paramo Nimatsaranam Vedyam Vastuvam Atravastu Shivadam Tapa Trayon Mulanam Vimad Bhagavate Mahamunikte Timva Purir Ishwaraha Sadyohidi aburudyate tra kriti bihi susu subistakshana. Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated. This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truth, which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. The highest truth is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. Such truth uproots the threefold misery. This beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity is sufficient in itself for God realization. What is the need of any other scripture? As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam, by this culture of knowledge, the Supreme Lord is established within his heart. Nigama kalpaturur galitam phalam sukamukad amrita drabya samyutam pivata Bhagavatam rasam alayam muhur aho O expert and thoughtful men, relish Shimad Bhagavatam, the mature fruit of the desire to read Vedic literature. It emanated from the lips of Sisugadev Goswami. Therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful. Even though its nectarine juice is already relishable for all, including liberated souls. Shinvatam Sakrata Krishna Gunya Shravana Kirtana Vidyam Taksto Hiabhadrani Vidu Noti Srihitsatam to hear about Krishna from Vedic literatures, or to hear from him directly from the through the Bhagavad Gita, 
is itself righteous activity. And for one who hears about Krishna, Lord Krishna is dwelling in everyone's heart, acts as a best-wishing friend, and purifies a devotee who constantly engages in hearing of him. Nastap prayesu badresu nityam bhagavata sevaya bhagavati uttama sloke bhaktir bhaviti nastiki in this way, a devotee naturally develops his dormant transcendental knowledge. As he hears more about Krishna from the Bhagavatam and from the devotees, he becomes fixed in the devotional service of the Lord. Cheta etar in avidam, stitvam slatpe prasiddhati. By development of devotional service, one becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance. And thus, material lusts and avarice are diminished. Evam prasana manaso, Bhagavad bhakti yogataha. Bhagavat Tattva Vigyanam Mukta Sangha Shijayate When these impurities are wiped away, the candidate remains steady in his position of pure goodness, becomes enlivened by devotional service, and understands the science of God perfectly. Vidyate Hridaya Grantis Chidyante Sarva Samsaya Siyante Chasyakarmani Krishna Evat Manishwari Thus Bhakti Yoga severs the hard knot of material affection and enables one to come at once to the stage of a Samsayam Samagram. Understanding of the supreme, understanding the supreme absolute truth, personality, Godhead. Shrimad Bhagavatam, Canto One, Chapter Fifteen, Verse Number Thirty Six. Yada Mukundo Bhagavan Nimamahim. Jaho Swatanva Shavani Yasatata Dadahar Eva Prati Buddha Chetasam Abadrahetu Kalil Anvamartata Translation by Srila Prabhupada. When the personality of Godhead, Lord Krishna, left this earthly planet in his self same form, from that very day, Kali, who had already partially appeared, became fully manifest to create inauspicious conditions for those who are endowed with a poor fund of knowledge. Her point by his divine grace, A.C. Bhakti Vinanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. The influence of Kali can be enforced only upon those who are fully developed. Uh, I'm sorry. The influence of Kali can be enforced only upon those who are not fully developed in God consciousness. One can neutralize the effects of Kali by keeping oneself fully under the supreme care of the personality of Godhead. The age of Kali ensued just after the battle of Kurikshet, but it could not exert its influence because of the presence of the Lord. 
The Lord, however, left this earthly planet in his own transcendental body. And as soon as he left, the symptoms of the Kali Yuga, as were envisioned by Maharaj Yudhisthira prior to Arjuna's arrival from Dwarka, began to manifest. And Maharaj Yudhisthira rightly conjectured on the departure of the Lord from the earth. As we have already explained, the Lord left our sight just as when the sun sets, it is out of our sight. Shimad Bhagavad Gita, Dr. Ajaki J, Srila Prabhupada Ki J. So this uh, verse confirms that whatever body was left behind, that was not Krishna's body. Because he left in the self same form. Uh, that is his transcendental spiritual body. So this is the trick. It's like the trick of a magician. Like, for example, uh, Prabhupada tells a story that when he was a, a younger child, his father talked took him to a, um, a theater where, there, where a magician was performing. And at one point, the magician came out and two ladies also came out. And they sort of guided him to get into this big black box. And by the time he got in, his head was over here and his leg and his feet were over there. And the rest of his body was just in the box. And then the two ladies with a big smile got a, a double-handled saw and started sawing the box in half. And they sawed it in half, and then they opened two sides, in the middle. And it looked like he was cut in half. And then they closed the curtain. And Maybe one minute later, they opened the curtain, and there was the magician who was cut in half, jumping up and down. Hari bo, hari bo, hari bo. <laughs> now, Prabhupada said, he, he saw him cut in half. What happened? How did he, you know, I mean, he saw it with his own eyes, but what he saw was what magicians do. They create an illusion. So in the same way, Krishna created an illusion, just like a magician, and left what seemed to be a material body behind. It was shot, was shot with an arrow in the foot. And by the way, if I shot you with an arrow in your foot, would you die? Probably not. You would hurt. <laughs> Probably wouldn't die. So anyway, uh, the whole thing was a hoax. But the atheists are so anxious to hear and proved that Krishna is not God. They jumped into that hoax. And even though it was not true, they believed it. Even to this day. So when one is overzealous for a particular goal, anything that seems to point to that goal, whether it's true or false, they'll accept it. And this, this happens often with Trump and the media. Every time they think, oh, this time he's done. Right? And they jump on the wagon of, of a false rumor. And then later on, when it's proven to be a false rumor, they already, they already have started the next false rumor. So this is a tactic. Just like when Rukmi was playing chess with Krishna, every time Krishna beat him, he said, I won. And that, of course, Krishna tolerated that, but finally he couldn't tolerate it anymore. So he, he uh, uh, took some action. So uh, we need to uh, carefully read the Bhagavatam and understand that Krishna has absolute powers. He can make uh, something material spiritual, and he can make something material, spiritual, material. 
He has that power. We don't have that power. That's the difference between us and Krishna. So the main point in this verse is that people who are endowed with a poor fund of knowledge, uh, then they become attacked by Kali. Now, how to avoid a poor fund of knowledge? It's by regularly hearing, morning and evening, Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam, and discussing it, and being actively engaged in the hearing and discussing, and churning this ocean of nectar to increase its potency. If you let water still, it'll eventually rot. If water is moving, always, it, it doesn't uh, get contaminated. Just like in India, you go, uh, if you drive from Calcutta to uh, Mayapur, on the way, especially in, in the outskirts of Calcutta, you'll see uh, the left-hand side or right-hand side ponds in front of houses, and they're full of vegetation. They're overgrown with vegetation. That's a sign that the pond is dying. If, if the water is moving all the time, that vegetation won't grow. But if it's dying, it's still, and the, there's heat, and, and, and it warms up, it, then plants grow in it, and eventually it, the pond dries up. So if we're not actively engaged in cultivating knowledge of Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam, we will dry up like that pond. And all those weeds will take over and strangle, the, uh, strangle us, our, our enthusiasm to be Krishna conscious, and Maya will take over. And Maya takes over in different ways. Like the, the one way Maya always takes over is, um, let's start a business and make money. So as soon as you start a business, to make money, you are in Maya's trap because you have to deal with a thousand different issues and they're never ending. And there's always anxiety, you know, building up the business and uh, maintaining it. It's like a friend of mine called me yesterday. He's not a devotee, but uh, a person I have dealings with a lot. And he said, he said, uh, Harry, you're a priest. I said, yes, I'm trying to be. He said, uh, does it ever stop? I said, what do you mean, does it ever stop? He said, I'm working so hard every day, and my work just increases. It doesn't decrease. It just keeps increasing. That's what I mean, does it ever stop? Do you have the same experience? Well, he said, I mean, you're in, you're in your, uh, uh, you know, senior age. Has your work gotten less or has it increased? I said, well, it's increased. Uh, the only difference is what I do now, I really enjoy. What I did before, I, I, it was, it was uh, always uh, difficult, but I tolerated it. He said, well, in my case, I'm not enjoying what I'm doing, I'm, I'm, but I'm working harder and harder. It doesn't get less. It just increases, he said. So <laughs> now, is there something wrong with making money? No, but it should not interfere with your Krishna consciousness. If it does, then you're in trouble because your mind is being taken away all the time with do mundane things. You have to be able to... Uh, well, Prabhupada's point was this. Uh, in fact, I can... I'm gonna, tomorrow I'm going to read some things about uh, Prabhupada's statements about uh, opening farms and, and, and rural communities. At one time he said, don't do it. And then after some time he said, this is very important, you must do it. <laughs> Well, it was because in the beginning, everyone was brahmacharya and brahmacharini. There were very few 
married couples. But over time, the natural sequence of events led to many devotees being married and very few uh, brahmacharis and brahmacharinis. So then Prabhupada emphasized the importance of farms and rural communities. But what did he emphasize? He said, don't do it as a business. He said he wanted Mayapur to be self-sufficient. He wanted new Mayapur in France to be self-sufficient. And he wanted all these rural communities to be self-sufficient. He said, don't try and make it a business. In this way, uh, you'll have a simple life and you'll, you'll have plenty of time for Krishna consciousness. He said, the whole idea is to have that time for Krishna consciousness so that uh, the devotees don't fall into sense gratification. As soon as their business, and, and another thing he said, big, big temples means big, big lawsuits. <laughs> That's another statement that he made. And uh, because, you know, a big, big temple means, you know, there's, there's going to be opulence. And we worship, we don't really worship in the mood of Radha and Krishna. We worship them in the mood of Lakshmi Narayana, who is opulence. Radha and Krishna worship is very, very simple doesn't have that material opulence to it, like the worship of Balaji or the worship of Varkadish or the worship of Vishnu forms. It's supposed to be very simple with the opulence of pristine nature. So I'm going to read those tomorrow. You can see what Prabhupada's plan was. Uh, he wanted the devotees to start... Uh, well, his main thing was book distribution and sankirtan. But because of a large population of grihastas, he also emphasized uh, varnashram dharma and uh, farms. But the idea of the farm was to, to simple living, high thinking. Because as soon as there's business, there, you're dealing with the material world and it becomes very complicated. Uh, but if uh, if you're just working on self-sufficiency, being completely independent, off the grid, not dependent on anything from the outside, and that's that's what his understanding was about self-sufficiency, not being dependent on anything from the outside. <clears throat> but the idea was, if we could attain that, then this would be a model that many, many people in the future would respect and strive for also, because what is the symptom of a complicated, digital, technologically advanced society? Stress. Everybody is stressed. We talked about this the other day, how everyone that comes to speak in Microsoft, they talk about how to diminish your stress. Even the devotee preachers, <laughs> it's the same thing. So, uh, yeah, there's stress. This is a stressful world. And, and people get wiped out by the stress and they go crazy and they start killing and they start doing all kinds of uh, unsavory, crazy things because they're stressed. They're not satisfied. They are constantly seeking uh, something different. Prabhupada said, Western devotees have two diseases. One, they always like to change things. And two, they're attached to sex life. He, he said Western devotees. He didn't say Western people. He said Western devotees. So, so this desire to always change things and uh, attachment to sense gratification. So the only way to overcome those foibles, those weaknesses, those, those uh, uh, what you would call uh, lacking determination to follow strictly is by regulated life. Uh, the difference between the karmis and the devotees is that devotees are regulated and karmis are not regulated. The ones that are regulated, they're regulated for sense gratification not for spiritual life. So this is explained in the sixth chapter of Bhagavad Gita. It's a very interesting purport. 
Uh, let me find a verse. Uh. Prabhupada says, as long as the material body exists, one has to meet the demands of the body, namely eating, sleeping, defending, and mating. But a person who is in pure bhakti yoga or in Krishna consciousness does not arouse the senses while meeting the demands of the body. Ah, you see, does not arouse the senses while meeting the needs of the body. Rather, he or she accepts the bare necessities of life, making the best use of a bad bargain, and enjoys transcendental happiness in Krishna consciousness. Uh, so, accepts the bare necessities of life. That's the point. If you ever want to be self-sufficient, you have to diminish your consumption of energy. Because... Uh, uh, producing energy uh, is a, it can be expensive. Uh, you can see, you know, if you keep your heater on all day long in the wintertime and all night long, your bill in the winter is a lot more than your bill in the summer. Right? And if you're running, you know, refrigerators and washing machines and dryers and uh, toasters and uh, all kinds of things, uh, you're going to have a lot of energy use. Okay? So in order to, to maintain that type of energy use by an alternate method, it's not easy. Uh, so therefore, in the way you become self-sufficient is reducing the amount of energy you need to produce, uh, pro to, to, uh, to live, because energy is expensive in, in America. Right? So if you go back to the village life in, in traditional in India, they didn't have uh, refrigerators, dryers, washing machines. <laughs> they didn't have any of those things. They still existed, right? Uh, even in cold climates, you know, the people living in Himalaya still, you know, in, in Dehradun and places like they still existed, but they didn't have all these things, right? Uh, so, but, but they used renewable uh, energy things like cow dung and uh, wood and things like that. They're all renewable. Whereas you use oil, it's it's, it's renewable, but it takes about Two or three million years to renew, so it's 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 not considered renewable because it's such a long period it takes to make it. Okay, so uh, it says, rather he accepts the bare necessities of life, making the best use of a bad bargain, and enjoys transcendental happiness in Krishna consciousness. Yeah, the more simpler you live, the more happy you are because you have more time for Krishna consciousness. He is calloused toward the incidental occurrences, such as accidents, disease, scarcity, and even the death of a most dear relative. But he is always alert to execute his duties in Krishna consciousness or bhakti yoga. Accidents never deviate him from his duty. As stated in the Bhagavad Gita 2.14, Agama payano nityas tam bharatam. He endures all such incidental occurrences because he knows that they come and go and do not affect his duties. In this way, he achieves the highest perfection in yoga practice. So people who are information, uh, low information people, they get attacked by maya. People who are high information people, and, and information it doesn't mean you know you know, the batting average of every American League baseball player. That's not, that's not high information. High information is you know Krishna and his pastimes and his 
qualities and his uh, interactions with uh, devotees, etc. You know all those things. That's high information. And you will not be attacked by Maya. Okay, so are there any questions? Yes. Yes. Why is Kali coming? Because uh, it's inevitable that it comes. There's four ages. There's Satya Yuga, uh, Treta Yuga, Dwapara Yuga, Kali Yuga. It's destined to be that way. Those are four ages of time. But it's not that everyone has to become a nonsense in Kali Yuga. By the mercy of Chaitanya, we have a 10,000-year window of auspiciousness to get out of Kali Yuga. It's due to the Sankirtan movement. After that period, it's going to be very difficult for people in Kali Yuga. It's already difficult now, but imagine what it means to be very difficult, right? So if we stick to this Harinam Sankirtan and chanting Hare Krishna and hearing Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam, we will not be affected in this age of Kali. But if we slacken or negligent, then we're going to be seriously affected and illusioned. So you're asking me, okay, so in the Battle of Kurukshetra, all the bad guys got killed. How come, you know, uh, Krishna has let Kali Yuga start? Well, uh, he's, in, he's responsible for maintaining the principles of religion, so therefore it, he comes back as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, but the most merciful, uh, munificent incarnation. He doesn't ask anyone to surrender to him. He just asks everyone, please chant, take prasadam and be happy. Actually, Lord Chaitanya Prabhupada said, Lord Chaitanya never even preached in public. He just did kirtan and distributed prasadam. He only, he only preached in private to elevated devotees like Ramananda Rai, etc., and Sanatana Goswami and Rupa Goswami. Now, that means that he's giving us a chance to engage in the Sankirtan movement and take credit for spreading this movement. So we should preach. We should go out regularly, talk to people in all different walks of life. And we should try and encourage them to find out more about Krishna consciousness. So just like yesterday, the day before you say something interesting happened, uh, the devotee who took out the truck drove away and left the table with the pundi box. <laughs> <laughs> that that takes a lot, a lot of uh, let's say attention to do such a thing. So he drives off, leaves the, the table in the hundi box. The hundi box had about one hundred fifty dollars in it. So one man, his name is Tim. You know who that Tim is? Yeah. He sees the hundi box. He sees the truck going away and the hundi box and the table there. So he picked them up and kept them, and yesterday he brought them back with all the money in it. He didn't even open the money. And the devotees were shocked, and uh, they gave him some books for free. I told him you, should have given, you have to give him some money. I said, next time he comes, give him at least $10 or something. I mean, he saved $150, right? So... Uh, this is how, uh, you see, why would he bring it back? I mean, uh, normally, the type of people who come, they would just take it, right? That means he's become a little bit purified by taking prasadam on a regular basis. And he has some respect for us. 
right? That doesn't mean everybody that's coming would have done that, but Krishna arranged it in that way. Teach us a lesson and to show us that, you know, it's, we're not doing this in vain. It's not that we're just serving grub. We're serving prasadam, and we're serving it with respect uh, for all the people that come, even the ones that are a little crazy, right? And it has its effect. Why would he do such a thing, right? Uh, because he had some respect for the devotees. <clears throat> so, uh, huh? Yeah. Right. When? Well, they wanted to get the mercy, probably. They wanted to get the mercy. You, you, now you're their guru. You've chanted on their beads. <laughs> you have it this as your first disciple. <laughs> if you start having headaches and stomach aches, you're getting the karma. <laughs> okay, well, see, that's the point. The, not everybody has the same appreciation, right? But this guy, Tim, you know, kudos to him. I mean, that's, you know, there was no reason for him to bring it back. Hope so. I hope so. Yeah. Well, maybe he saw that you're always happy, always smiling. <laughs> yeah, so there's a difference, see? One person steals the beans, the other person brings back the money. <laughs> Howdy, Bo. Oh, glory to Srila Prabhupada. Actually, we're having a lot of problem with the hundi box. Uh, almost everybody doesn't put the hundi box out. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> 